Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I want to talk to you today about, I guess, uh, some of my experiences uh, not managing to write reliable and maintainable tests with WebDriver end-to-end -end tests and uh, some of the mistakes I've made along the way in the hope that uh, some of you can learn from my mistakes and have a bit of an easier time. How many people here have experience writing end-to-end -end tests of any sort with okay, nearly everyone? Great. I guess that's why you'd come. Um, uh, how many of you found it easy to make them reliable, maintainable, and fast? About three people. Okay. Uh, I'll pick your brains later. Uh, so uh, when I knew I was going to be doing this talk, I asked a few people what their top tip would be for uh, reliable and maintainable and fast end-to-end -end tests. And one thing came up more than any other, and that was uh, don't. They don't have the best reputation for being reliable, easy to maintain, fast, for good reason. And I guess in some ways this is good advice, right? If you don't need to write end-to-end -end tests, if they're not going to give you enough value, then don't bother because in my experience they are a lot of work um, and ongoing investments needed and there's bigger challenges at each scale you get with them. So yeah, if that works for you, then great, but as you're not all running out the door, I imagine that some of you have good use cases for end-to-end -end tests. So um, I'm uh, Benji Weber. I'm Benji Weber on Twitter. I'd love to hear your questions, comments, thoughts, heckles afterwards um, or during. I won't be checking Twitter during. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear from you. I work for a company called Unruly. Um, uh, at Unruly, I have the privilege of working with products that are, I guess, universally beloved, you could say. Um, you've probably appreciated these. Uh, every day, even today, they've enriched your experience as you browse the web. I'm talking about online advertising. Uh, yeah, groans. Um, so advertising doesn't have the best reputation. It's, uh, um, it annoys us often, but it is important. Right? It pays for a lot of the content that we enjoy online, um, and it brings with it a number of technical challenges and responsibilities that uh, are relevant to end-to-end uh, -to -end testing. And the detail is really important. This is a graph from uh, a few weeks ago. Um, this was our CDN costs, and they suddenly shot up, and we investigated why. It turned out to be a file that was literally empty that we were serving, zero bytes in size. We deployed with the wrong caching headers, and suddenly our costs had shot up through the roof. So the detail is really important. We have a reasonable amount of scale, not the kind of CERNs and Ubers and Facebooks we've been hearing about at the conference, but we're still collecting terabytes of data every day, hundreds of thousands of requests per second. The detail is important. And there's, uh, I guess, three reasons uh, why the strategy of not building these tests doesn't really work for us in advertising. The first one is user experience. User experience might seem like an odd thing to talk about in the context of advertising. Why does the user experience matter? Well, um, I expect you can all think of a time when you've had a poor user experience with an advert. Maybe it's popped up in front of the thing that you were reading. It's blasted audio in your ears, distracting you from what you were doing. You've been hunting through your background tabs, trying to find which one's actually playing sound. So I don't know how that made you feel, but it probably didn't endear you to the brand that was doing the advertising. Right? So the user experience is important, and it's important that we can test the actual user experience, or as close as possible, that uh, people are really experiencing on their real devices, real browsers. Speaking of browsers, we can directly measure the cost of not supporting different browsers. We can see the amount of traffic, the amount of money we'd make if we supported an extra browser. So it's really valuable to us to be able to support as many as possible. And while we could manually test all these different browsers, uh, being able to 
automate testing end-to-end -end with the real browsers is really valuable to allow us to make sure that our stuff continues to work. And finally, there's, there's a lot of danger in advertising. Right? We're running code across thousands and thousands of websites across the open web. There's a lot that we could mess up, and there's a lot of people's uh, use of the web that we could mess up if we cock things up. And there's a lot of, we see thousands of new ads every day as well, and they can interact in unknown ways with things. So end-to-end -end tests help us to mitigate this danger to some extent. So we've got all this, this danger um, that, we're, that we're trying to live with. But there's also a lot of value to be able to learn fast. Advertising, in advertising we have a lot of data. It's one thing we're not short of. And if we can build things fast, deploy things fast, learn fast, we can um, run experiments in production, we can see how things affect our data, and we can uh, uh, iterate on our products more quickly. But this, this only works if we have a safety net, right? So if we had to manually test everything in every browser every time we made a change, then we wouldn't be able to uh, make use of the data we have to learn quickly. At uh, Unruly, we're quite uh, well set up for this kind of fast iteration. We practice extreme programming. If you're not familiar with extreme programming, that means you'll see us doing things like pair programming, two people working at the same time on the same computer, solving the same problem. So everything's reviewed at the time it's written. You'll see us working in bigger groups, so-called mob programming. There was a talk about this yesterday, where you have maybe the whole team sitting around the same computer working on the same thing at the same time. So everything is reviewed at the time it's written, it's uh, good quality, it's ready to release to production. You'll see us doing things like uh, test-driven development. We'll always write a failing test first, see it uh, pass, refactor, improve the code, and iterate improving our design and building up our test coverage. So auto test automation is really at the heart of everything we've always done. And our team has also collectively own everything about a product. So they're not just building uh, new features, they're also doing testing, they're also uh, working with stakeholders to think of new valuable things we can add to those products, and they're also keeping them running in production. So really cross-functional teams. I tell you this because, um, as a bit of context, because I want to tell you about our journey with uh, automated end-to-end -end testing and some of the successes and mistakes we've made along the way. When I started at Unruly, this, this, this journey, I guess, is over the course of eight or nine years, so quite a long time. When I started, the, it turned out that there'd been some experimentation with end-to-end -end testing, and we were in the process of purging that, those tests from our code base. It hadn't gone very well. When I inquired as to why, it turned out that they'd been worse than useless. Uh, how can tests be worse than useless? Well, if they're unreliable, then they erode your confidence in the entire test suite. Right? Uh, so people had taken the view, probably correctly, that uh, it's better to delete these tests and have confidence in the non-end-to-end -end tests that remain. So for a long time, we did without end-to-end -end testing at all. We relied on what I think Martin Fowler calls subcutaneous testing, where you have this kind of thin layer of UI that you try and keep as thin as possible, and then you kind of test everything that's underneath that through the APIs. So you avoid some of the challenges of testing everything through the UI that I'll be talking about. That did us for quite some time. We were basically uh, following the advice that people have of not building these tests at all. But uh, unfortunately, that didn't do us for very long. There were things that pushed us to improve. The most memorable of these was an occasion, I think we were doing something mundane like a brand update to our application, and we received this email. It was quite understated. It was from our 
CDN account manager, and they said something like, uh, by the way, uh, this, this should have rung alarm bells because uh, in Britain, if someone says, by the way, it usually means my main point is. Uh, so, so yeah, by the way, 90% uh, of your CDN traffic is currently resulting in internal server errors. It was, uh, as we like to say, not ideal. So how could this be? We, we like to think of ourselves as a, a good team. We do all these things like pair programming and test-driven development. We like to think we're building quality software. Could this be true? Well, it was. Uh, you can probably guess something about the cause if I tell you that all this traffic was to forward slash undefined on our CDN domain. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was JavaScript, or more accurately, our terrible JavaScript. Um, what had happened was that so we had a loop in this thin UI layer, uh, which had an end condition that was an equality check. And in one particular new version of a browser, the loop counter was getting double incremented due to a perhaps legitimate difference in behavior. Jumping off the end of the loop condition and uh, uh, making requests that resulted in this slash undefined traffic. Uh, so it slipped through. There were a number of similar incidents that made us think it's time to level up. We basically inflicted a self-distributed denial of service attack against ourselves. Um, it's the final straw, I think, for me. The thing that made me say, enough is enough, let's do something about this now, was... Uh, uh, having to come into work on a Saturday um, because uh, we had a problem where UI elements were misaligned and covering things up. Uh, this uh, uh, was a big problem. I had to come in on a Saturday. Um, the user experience things I was talking about, bad user experiences can be caused by bugs as well as uh, intentionally. And I uh, had to come in to fix this, and I wasn't very happy about it. It's uh, amazing how um, developers can be motivated to fix things that uh, make improvements to their development process if they're responsible for looking after stuff in production. I recommend it. So I brought it up with a team. Uh, you may be able to tell I drew these myself. I uh, put it up with a team, and as you might expect if you've uh, tried to instigate any change. There were a number of different perspectives on it. There were kind of the cynics, the, uh, we've been here before, this doesn't work, we know that they're worse than useless, let's not waste our time with these end-to-end -end tests. Um, then you've got your kind of uh, enthusiasts, the people that think, oh, these would have solved all these problems that we've had, let's do it now. And you've got your more realist people, like, yes, it would be valuable, but it's a lot of work to invest in this. There were some concerns, um, so myself being quite motivated by having to come in on my day off, um, I ended up building a prototype, what in uh, extreme programming circles we call a spike, a spike solution, so-called because it's like a long, thin um, thing that you can drive through something else end-to-end -to, -end to prove that something works end-to-end, -end, but it's very thin in itself. So I built a little prototype. Um, that demonstrated that we could retrofit our um, retrofit some end-to-end -end tests on our existing uh, ads and applications uh, without having to change them significantly and also uh, mitigating some of the, the concerns that other people in the team had. It's often disputes are down to uh, differences in understanding or uncertainty and prototypes are a great way of resolving that sometimes. So anyway, we decided to uh, proceed with uh, building out some end-to-end -end tests. And there were some things that we did early that paid off really well. One of them was investing in uh, building them with the page object pattern. People heard of the page object pattern? About half, OK. A page object pattern um, is basically uh, it's just abstracting your tests away from the mechanics of interacting with the, the page, the DOM, the, the browser. So we, um, there's a number of reasons for this. It paid off quite well for us because, um, well, not only did it help us with some of the reliability challenges that I'll talk about, 
It also um, meant that as we were going through multiple iterations of our UI, we could often keep the same tests and just change this mapping layer. Our page objects that sit between the tests and the uh, mechanics of interacting with the page. So this is a little example. This is probably not the best page object test example because it's one of our early ones. Uh, it's rather low level abstraction wise. Um, but you probably get the idea. There's no web driver API stuff in here and there's no um, CSS selectors or XPath. So it's checking, can we share the ad on Twitter? We get an ad. We try and share it, and then we check that we go to Twitter to actually share the ad. So that it paid off, as I mentioned, for various reasons. But it wasn't long before the kind of spectre of sporadic failure reared its ugly head again. And uh, then you hear people saying, uh, "The test just ran the tests, and they failed, but I ran them again, and they passed, so it's all fine." No, it's not. And then you hear people saying, well, this is what we said was going to happen all along. Uh, we told you these don't work. Uh, let's go and delete the tests, or let's delete the unreliable ones, which is generally good advice if it's unreliable, delete the test. Then I'm thinking, have I wasted everyone's time by investing in this test suite? Um, so we, we thought about deleting the unreliable tests, but we thought maybe we'll delete one test, and then another one, and another one. We'll end up deleting them all, because we didn't really understand why they were unreliable. So we realized that we needed to invest in diagnostics. Because if a test fails one in 10,000 times, good luck trying to reproduce that when you're trying to run it on your workstation. So we built some uh, JUnit rules. JUnit rules are a great way of hooking in some code before, after, during your test execution, wrapping your test cases. We built a little rule that looked out for an annotation that we could annotate our tests with called quarantine. And if we quarantined a test, it effectively meant we were deleting the test in that uh, the test non-deterministically failing would not block our test suite from passing. But it was a bit more subtle than that. If the test deterministically failed, it would still fail the test suite because we might have broken something. Um, but importantly, if it non-deterministically failed, it would file a ticket to our ticketing system with some diagnostics about what had happened to help us investigate the cause. Now, this is a little bit dangerous. Uh, uh, there's some, we've published some of these rules on GitHub. Uh, don't worry about copying the URL down. I'll tweet the slides later if you want them. But it's a bit dangerous without discipline, right? Because this rule was effectively rerunning the tests until they pass or fail deterministically a few times. And you could quite easily at that point say, well, our suite's passing now, we can ignore the problem again. But with discipline, it proved to be really useful because we've got diagnostics and we can work out what's going on. So some of the things that we started collecting, not just the traditional like error messages and stack traces, but the browser request logs, all the HTTP requests that the browsers made, and how long they took, and what they resulted in, the HA archive, the JavaScript console output, screenshots during the test execution. And uh, so with, with these things, it was a bit more like having the dev tools open in front of you to try and work out what was going on. And this proved to be really useful. It's quite easy to do with the JUnit rule as well. So we just have a rule that wraps the test execution in the try-catch, catches the exception, and wraps it in one of these, what we call an additional diagnostics exception, that uh, just adds the heart archive screenshots, et cetera, um, that it queries using the WebDriver API. So what did we learn from these diagnostics? Well, the big one, and this is one you'll uh, come across if you look at any article on reliable web driver tests is that you need to wait for things, right? You need to wait for the test to get into a particular state before doing the next thing because you've got all these asynchronous operations going on in your browser. And maybe the button you're trying to click on hasn't loaded yet or uh, maybe the, the things are taking longer than normal. So this, this is an example of where our early investment in page objects paid off really well because like, there were a load of places where we were doing things like trying to click a brand bar in the ad. 
and uh, rather than updating all of the tests that we're doing that, we could go and update the implementation of that to wait for it to appear before clicking on it. <laughs> Similarly, um, we ended up building a load of utilities. They've got this wait until that uh, can take references to our uh, page objects and wait for something to happen where our page objects expose a condition. I'll show an example of that in a moment. Uh, it's basically just a little method that uh, takes a, a lambda expression or method reference and waits for the thing to be true using the WebDriver API. So it wasn't just waiting for uh, interactivity that we needed to do, but also waiting for assertions. Uh, we were very used to writing tests where we say assert that something is true. We realized that most of the time we wanted to wait until something was true instead because um, we didn't know how long it was going to take to become true. So we wait for it to become true with a timeout. So we built a load of uh, little utility uh, assertions that used weights under the hood rather than just asserting something at a particular point in time. Um, again, taking a method reference. Uh, here's a little example. So we've got a, a whole load of these, but we're just taking a, a supply of Boolean or a condition um, that might become true in the future, and then underneath the hood we can use a web driver wait. Um, it just makes things a little less verbose because we've wrapped this in a utility that looks a bit like the assertions that you do normally. So really, the, the vast majority of our early uh, reliability challenges were down to timing and either having unexpected explicit assumptions about how long things would take in our tests or more subtle things. But that didn't last very long. It wasn't long before people were saying the tests are flaky again, uh, or worse, ignoring them because they, they were flaky. But really the next time this happened, it turned out that the tests had been falsely accused of being flaky. Uh, when we investigated it using our diagnostics, we realized it wasn't the tests that were unreliable, it was our implementations. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why it's really important to make sure that tests are reliable, because uh, otherwise people just assume it's the test problem and not your implementations, and it's really easy to write non-deterministic implementations of web stuff as well. It raised the question though, does that, does that really matter? Um, People, are, people on the web are quite used to things not really working. Right? If your page doesn't load properly, you'll probably reload it um, or blame your network provider or something. Uh, it mattered to us because like, even if you've got a 0.01% failure rate and you've got 100,000 tests, then you're quite likely to have a bad, a bad time. Things are going to fail a lot. Um, but what can we do about it? We rely on loads of third parties for web stuff. Uh, people you might not even think of, CDN providers, DNS servers, how many people think about DNS as dependency of their web stuff working. Uh, networks, if the network's congested, maybe your JavaScript doesn't load for twice as long and things don't behave the same. How much do we test for this stuff? So it's really hard. So what can we do about it? Well, I guess one thing we realized was that their tests, yes, they're, they're more complex tests with uh, more infrastructure and browser level complexity, but they're still tests and we can apply the same kind of principles that we'd apply to our um, unit tests. Right? Well, we can stub out dependencies. Maybe we're making a call out to a third party service in all of our tests and it's not particularly reliable. Why do we need to do that? We probably only need to do that in some tests and in the others we can stub out that call and things will be more reliable. Also, a lot of our flakiness turned out to be down to networks because they frequently don't work. Um, they, uh, yeah, you get random requests failing one in a thousand times and yeah, it, dealing with that is hard. So what do we do in unit tests? We isolate things. So we ended up bringing all these resources, images, JavaScript, uh, HTML stuff, all onto the same boxes where we're running the tests. And that eliminated um, probably our next biggest cause of test flakiness, just by getting rid of the network involvement. 
basically our web stuff is never really working. It's, it's in a constant state of some things don't work for some small percentage of users and requests. So we really needed to think about what was a tolerable failure rate. Um, rather than thinking about things should always work. One of the tools for that we have, uh, another JUnit rule that just repeatedly runs our test over and over again um, uh, with looking for an annotation again on the test and gives us a report about uh, how reliable it was. <clears throat> um, but it led us to a realization that maybe we should be treating our tests more like our production monitoring. We don't expect our production systems to be 100% available. We work out what an acceptable availability is, and we bake that into the way that we monitor things. And maybe we should be doing the same thing with tests. Right? There's a huge amount of complexity in the stuff we're testing. Maybe it doesn't matter if the, it doesn't work to the business one in a million times, maybe, but it does matter if it doesn't work one in 10 times. So what is, where does that lie? And we, c we can bake that into our test suite runners as well and only have them fail if they determine the failure rate to uh, d rise above an acceptable threshold. Once we started thinking about our tests that way, it raised some opportunities. Because if, if, let's get that. Uh, if, if our tests are, if we're thinking about our tests like monitoring, then we can, maybe we can use them as monitoring. We've, we'd by this time built up a test suite that uh, checked lots and lots of aspects of behavior in an isolated environment. But we were still quite vulnerable in production, and we realized we've got exactly the same web stuff in production. The only difference is the URL we're pointing at. So we were able to point the test suite at our production systems by changing the URL and have them tell us whether the behavior was working in production as well. Now, that's a bit of a simplification. There were a number of challenges to overcome, like not generating the side effects in production, um, isolating test data. But these things are overcomable, subject for another talk, probably. But it's an aspect, it's an example of um, some extra value that we were able to get out of these test suites. Another opportunity that uh, we found was that we could check invariance things that should always be true for every bit of behavior that we had in our tests. Uh, for us, a big one is sound. I mentioned earlier, people generally don't like it when you play sound at them in ads on the web. Um, so we, we could add an invariant that checked by capturing input to the sound device that no behaviors we have result in sound for the user. That turned out to be quite useful because uh, <laughs> we develop on workstations that don't have speakers. And it's really easy to not notice that you've done something that results in sound or doesn't mute things properly. So this caught some problems. But interestingly, it also introduced some flakiness. Um, this really underscores the importance of having good diagnostics, because uh, this took us quite a while to track down. We couldn't work out why the there is no sound assertion was failing sporadically. And it turned out to be because occasionally you'd get a big ding, and you've probably come across this when you're doing an important presentation, uh, but there are things on uh, machines that have a graphical environment set up to, that we can run real browsers in uh, that make sound, like there are updates to install, or uh, your antivirus is out of date, or other things like that. Um, and this was happening and causing our, on our test runners and causing things to fail. So good diagnostics are really useful. Uh, there loads of other stuff, actually. Um, we've run into problems with the browsers themselves crashing, which you can mitigate to some extent by uh, capturing the fact that's happened, because it generates in specific errors, and then restarting the browser. But some things are much harder. Like We've run into graphics driver bugs, where the uh, servers where we're running the tests, uh, we literally hit graphics driver bugs, hard locks the machine, and <laughs> your tests fail. Um, which uh, kind of leads me to think that uh, that there's, it's basically unattainable trying to get these things perfect. There's always going to be something, I think, even if 
If we're hitting graphics driver bugs, there's always going to be something that's, that's not working. We're experimenting with headless browsers to get around that, but headless browsers don't support all the features that, we, that we're using at the moment. So, um, by this point, we've got a quite a big test suite, and we're um, kind of got a good enough level of reliability from our tests, and we're dealing with the remaining non-reliability by treating our tests like production monitoring. And then, as our test suites get bigger and bigger, we run into other more uh, nice problems to have, like we've got so many tests that are now taking a long time to run. So I wanted to share a few tips uh, that we have uh, found useful to keep these tests fast. The XP book has the concept of a 10-minute build. Um, so in extreme programming, there's the idea that your build process, your test suite, should not take longer than 10 minutes to run. Um, because, uh, well, that's about the length of time it takes a cup of coffee and uh, it's about the amount of time you can tolerate maximum uh, if you're going to wait for something to happen and take action on the results if you're going to uh, notice that the tests have failed and fix it. If it takes longer than that, you lose that feedback loop. We've been reasonably good at sticking to that. So the first tip is probably the most controversial, and that is to make these tests a synchronous part of your process. This is uh, the thing that extreme programming advises. Um, but as developers, we love making things asynchronous. Right? Things are slow and annoying. Let's make it asynchronous, run it in the background, ignore it. Um, and, and it doesn't matter how long it's taking. And before you know it, your tests are taking 24 hours to run, and uh, <laughs> then you've got more problems. But if you keep it a synchronous part of your process, then A, you can respond to the feedback from your, your tests failing, like they fail, and you've still got the context about why they might have failed, and you can respond to that. But also, um, it incentivizes you to keep them fast, because uh, you're just going to get really annoyed if you're bored sitting there waiting for things to happen. So you're constantly encouraged to invest in speeding them up. There's lots of simple things you can do. Delete tests. Tests have an inventory cost to keeping them around. If they're things that are slow and they're not providing enough value, then why not delete them? There's no, nothing special about test code, really. Um, we talked about we were using tests as production monitoring. Uh, in that case, there are some things that we, we don't really want to be broken for a week, but if they're broken for a bit, it's not that big a deal, and we can just have them as production monitoring and not have them as part of our test suite um, if they're very minor features. Um, and then we talked about stubbing dependencies out in the context of reliability because dependencies can be unreliable. It also helps in uh, performance. If you have to go halfway around the world to fetch a resource, that's going to take time and, uh, and uh, stubbing out responses that are slow speeds the tests up. But the big one um, that, I guess, if it's not a silver bullet, but it solves a lot of problems, is parallelizing them. Unless you do silly things like having one test depend on another, generally these end-to-end -end tests can be run in isolation. And we run, I think, uh, six or seven at the same time on a single node, and you can scale nodes up, um, and then you get a speed up. I guess there's there's nothing... I don't think that could stop you running a thousand tests on a thousand different servers um, really quickly. I'm waiting for someone to come up with a, uh, a complete way of running these on Amazon Lambda. There are some attempts. Uh, they're using the headless browser. There's some uh, missing features, but uh, I think we'll get there. Um, and yeah, running every test with a separate server would get them really fast. There were other kind of nice-to-have problems that we ran into. So there was performance. There was also kind of test smells and maintainability. So this was kind of maybe halfway through our journey. We'd um, built up quite a, a range of end-to-end uh, -end tests against our kind of ads. Um, and we thought we were getting pretty good at writing these tests. We're maybe a little too smug. Uh, and we... 
uh, decided to um, take the same approach and apply it to a much more complex web application. And we ran into test smells. The, the tests had a lot of repetition. They were doing things like every test would have to log in, navigate around the application, and uh, before getting to the place where we could actually do any useful assertions. And our page objects were quite smelly as well. They're uh, getting big and fat, loads of operations on every page because there was a lot of things that this app could do. And that's when we ran in, we came across a thing called the screenplay pattern. Anyone heard of the screenplay pattern? Not very many. Um, so the screenplay pattern, I believe, was uh, coined, invented by someone called Anthony Marconi. And it's so called, I guess, because it makes your tests read a bit like a screenplay. You've got actors and actions, things that happen. But it's really what you get if you take a test written with a page object pattern and you ruthlessly refactor it to the point where uh, you've uh, extracted lots of single responsibilities out that you can reuse and compose. Here's an example from one of our test suites. This is checking what happens if a user fails to log in. So we've got um, a little DSL going on. Um, we've got an actor, a publisher in this case. Uh, and then we say that when they use a browser and attempt to log in with the, the wrong password, then they have the wrong credentials message gets shown to them. Um, but the, the things I wanted to highlight, um, there's still some boilerplate there, and this was a real example, so it's not completely clean. Um, this log in as, that's a unit of behavior that we've extracted out from our tests and we can reuse in other tests. Same for this uh, have incorrect credentials message. It's a unit for behavior. It's basically just a function, right? And the real valuable thing that I wanted to highlight is that, that we've got functions, you can compose functions. And the great thing about the screenplay pattern is that you can have these actions any level of, of uh, granularity. So you can go low level, like clicking on something. You can then compose those up to higher level things, like logging in, and go up still further. So with this DSL, you can do something like attempt to log in as a publisher, then attempt to navigate to an earnings report, then attempt to view a saved report that they've seen before. And maybe we're saying we're doing that in a few different tests. You can extract those, compose those actions together, and uh, create a higher level action called, say, view earnings. We just extracted those functions, composed them, and then we attempt to a higher level action. Um, and this um, helped us out with a lot of the uh, maintainability challenges we had in a uh, bigger, more complex web application. Uh, some links. Uh, the Flick is a little DSL we've built internally for writing tests in this style. Uh, various other people have built similar DSLs. Um, and then there's this example project in the Serenity BDD project on GitHub that uh, applies this kind of style of testing to a kind of dummy application. Um, it's got a good example. Again, I'll tweet the link to the slides if you want the links later. So wrapping up, the things that I've talked about. There were a number of opportunities that arose from our investment in end-to-end -end tests. Uh, uh, it meant that we could test the entire user experience, including the user interface, which in itself is really valuable. It meant that we could run the same behavioral tests on lots of different browsers and check that uh, uh, things work in all different browsers. It meant that we could check invariants, things that should always be true, like sound is not on for us. And we could reuse the same test suites for monitoring our production systems. Some performance tips. Make the tests a synchronous part of your process if you want positive encouragement to keep them fast. Delete the things you're not using. Um, stub your dependencies out, your networks that are slow, and run the tests in parallel so you can uh, run more at the same time. And then 
I talked about some of our successes from the page object pattern, how it paid off that we could uh, fix some of the maintainability challenges within just our page objects without having to update thousands of tests. I talked about the screenplay pattern, how it improves on that. If you ruthlessly refactor your tests, then uh, you, they remain more maintainable. And then we talked about a load of things uh, with, oops, with related to reliability. Um, if you can get away without writing end-to-end -end tests, things are going to be a lot easier, not surprisingly. Um, we talked about the importance of good diagnostics so that you can work out what's going on because you get some really obscure things uh, like a sound and your browser's dying that are quite hard to work out otherwise. We talked about waiting for things to happen because um, timing is important in these tests. Um, and we talked about treating our tests like production monitoring, tolerating, tolerating a failure rate that's acceptable to us, uh, rather than expecting things will be 100% reliable because the infrastructure we rely on is not 100% reliable. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> got a few minutes left for questions, I think, if, if anyone's got any questions. Uh, yep. Did we test against different browsers? Uh, yes, um, so that was one of the extra bits of value that we got out of them. Um, and we, we've been using third-party service, so browser stack, for getting access to lots of browsers to test against. And you never encountered flakiness there? Uh, yes, lots of flakiness with relation to different browsers. Browsers crashing, some web drivers more reliable than others. Um, uh, yeah, some of it uh, we found workarounds for, such as uh, restarting the, um, the, the connection from scratch, um, moving the test to a new instance. Others are um, just part of the failure rate that we need to tolerate and decide what's an acceptable failure rate to us. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you for listening. I'll hang around if you've got any more questions. <laughs>